أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم أعهد إليكم يا بني آدم أن لا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين ونعبدوني هذا سراط مستقيم صدق الله العلي العظيم Did I not make a pact with you, O son of Adam to be wary of the, of the shaytan, of Iblis for verily he is an open enemy and worship me, this is the straight or the correct path. That in our lives, we live freely and we don't take much thought into our actions as if that we are free to do whatever we please and that there is nobody watching us or that there is nobody out to get us. If somebody was to live a life where they think or they act like somebody is out to get them, we would call that person paranoid. That this person is a paranoid person because he thinks somebody is out to get him. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us in the Holy Quran that there is an open enemy who is out to get us. And this open enemy is the shaitan. Iblis is very real. Iblis is very true. And it's very possible the greatest feat of Iblis is to make people think that he does not exist. That Iblis whispers into the hearts of men things, bad ideas, bad thoughts, and pushes them along with their nafs al-ammara to commit sin, to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is something we have to take very seriously. This is something we have to we live our lives by that we have this open enemy that is around us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not worship him, but worship me. How does one worship the devil? Is it by drawing uh, pentagrams or cutting themselves or whatever it is that, that people that claim to worship the devil do? No, it's obviously not that. As we mentioned earlier, that if somebody even listens to somebody speak, they worship that person, the narration says. If he speaks of Allah, then they worship Allah. And if he speaks of Iblis, then they worship Iblis. Now, we see that throughout our lives, Iblis is always waiting on the ambush. And Iblis always uses different tactics to try and get us. He's always plotting and planning and revising his tactics to be able to get us to fall into sin. One of the greatest tactics of Iblis is to create the environment of sin. Because once you create the environment of sin, and Iblis is weak, weak by the way, it's as easy as us seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Iblis will disappear. Mentioning the name of Allah and Iblis will disappear. We know from the Holy Quran when Iblis asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he can live a long life at least. That he's been cast out of heaven but give me a long life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you have been given until the day that we have prescribed. That being the day of judgment or earlier, Allahu a'lam. We have diff differing narrations. However, he says how shall I eat and how shall my soldiers eat? He says you eat with whomever does not remember the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his food. And you sleep with whoever does not remember the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he sleeps, etc, etc. Even to the point where this is how he has his children. For the people that consummate marriage without remembrance of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other factors, this is how Iblis has his children and his soldiers. That there are people sometimes that are in the shape of human beings, but within them they are Satan. So Iblis tries to create the environment of sin to make it easier for you to sin. Why? The way we see it is if everybody is guilty of something, then nobody is guilty of something. Simple as that. When people say that everybody is doing it, that's always an excuse. You say, for example, this is haram. Yeah, it's haram, but everybody's doing it. Why can't I do it too? Everyone's doing this thing, so I might as well do it. So he creates or he helps you create that environment of sin. The best way for him to do that is through your friends and your companions. 
Tonight we remember the companions of Imam Al-Hussain alayhi salam So it is fitting to talk about who we should take as companions Who we should take as friends Now obviously people do not select their friends via a list They don't sit there and say oh you can be my friend and you can't be my friend No, but obviously there's more subtle ways to select the group of friends that you hang around with Or the group of friends that you are with The narration of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam when he is asked, asked about sadaqah or asdiqa to take somebody as a friend so he says لا تكون الصداقة إلا, بحدود إلا بحدودها فمن كانت فيه هذه الحدود أو شيء منها فأنسبوه, إليه فأنسبوه إلى الصدقة ومن لم يكن شيء منها فلا تنسبوه إلى شيء من الصداقة and then he speaks about what they are. So he says, if somebody ha is within these limits of friendship, take him as a friend. However, if he is out of these limits and realms of friendship, then don't even give him a bit of friendship. They don't open those doors for friendship for this person if they don't have these categories. So he says, the first of them, he says, uh, the first of them That his open self and his outward self is one That he shouldn't be somebody that's two-faced If you find someone that's a face in front of you and a face behind your back Don't take this person as a friend But subhanAllah the thing is you know the old English saying Birds of a feather flock together That however you act or however you present yourself or your disposition, this is the sort of friends that you will attract. The way that you are, these are the sort of friends that you will attract. So if you are somebody that's two-faced, you will attract two-faced people. It's as simple as that. Now, for somebody to have whatever is within the, their, in, in, their inwardness and their outwardness to be the same, it is really a great feat. And you notice you meet a lot of people that you talk to them, for example, about religion, they speak about religion. Talk to them about cars, they speak about cars. Talk to them about fighting, they'll speak about fighting. Talk to them about travel, they'll speak about travel. That they'll, they'll flip the conversation to whatever is your interest. And I find this a lot with people that either have a lot of knowledge or with people that have many faces. That they know what to speak to certain people about. You notice those people that, for example, when they speak to the to uh, your parents, they seem like angels and your parents are like, oh, this guy is a very good friend or she's a very, very nice person. What a good person this is to have as a friend. But outwardly, you know there's something else that when you and that friend are alone, you know that their personality is different, that they have the ability to show that face. So firstly, he says that you need their inward and their outwardness should be the same. And then he says, وَالثَّانِي أَنْ يَرَى زِينَكَ زِينَتَهُ that he sees that whatever it is that adorns you is something that adorns him. And whatever is bad upon you is something that's bad upon him. So in other words, when, when he, when, uh, if he sees that you might fall in trouble from something, he sees himself as falling in trouble. And if he sees that something would be good on him, then he'd like it also upon you. This is very important, that it, basically loving for others what you would love for yourself. In fact, this is core in the way that we should treat each other and be around with each other. Most importantly, to our families, to our wives, to the people that are near most to us, to our parents. This is the way that we should treat them. You notice how a lot of the time we hold a lot of respect and reverence for a foreigner. However, for the people that are closest to us, we know they'll handle more, so we give them more. We know that they, they'll accept a lot more uh, trash from us, so we give them more trash. This is wrong. That you should, whatever you feel is something would be good upon you, you feel it upon them, and whatever is evil upon you, you would feel it uh, evil upon them. He says, then the third thing, Salaam wa rahmatullah. La wilayatun wa mal. That nothing will change him, even if he gets a position of power or, or wealth. Check that if, if he's someone that gets wealth and he becomes different or someone that gets a position of power, he becomes different. And some people are like that, unfortunately, without dwelling too much on the point. However, you see some people that they acquire a position of power or a position, for example, a, a, a good job or any position within the community. And then all of a sudden they don't know anybody. They refuse to be spoken to unless you use their title, etc., etc. Or they may get wealth. And once they get the wealth, they refuse to... 
you, you become beneath them. They become on another level. And then he says, and makduratahu. He says that he will not stop you, or he will not stop giving you whatever he has the ability of. That he, he will not stop something from you of what he has the ability of. So in other words, he's generous. And he says, and the fifth, that all of these things are, are in one. Is that, لا يسلمك عند النكبات So that he doesn't leave you when he finds you in a position of trouble. This is the most important thing. That a lot of people are your friends up until a certain degree. They, they, you have that friendship with them, except when they see you fall into hardship, all of a sudden you see people step away. You see people fall back. As Imam Ali alayhi salam says, that the rich man has a friend everywhere he goes. You notice the rich people, wherever they go, wherever they go, they're known and they have friends. And the poor man is a stranger even in his hometown. That the poor person, nobody knows the poor person. He lives, he's born, he dies, nobody knows nothing about him. Why? This is how people are. They tend, to do, they tend to do this, they tend to lead towards these sort of people. Now let's say for example a rich man loses his wealth, then you notice that people fall out. People drop away from this person. So these are the sort of things, these are the sort of characteristics that you look for when you're selecting your group of friends. When you're selecting the people you hang around, around with. Why? You want to create an environment where it's difficult for you to sin. You want to be in an environment where it's difficult for you to sin. For example, a small thing, just coming to these places of worship, like the mosques and the Husseiniyat that we have. By being a regular attendant, you place yourself in that environment where you find it hard to sin. Let's say, for example, somebody, when he's alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sins. However, before the people, he feels it a bit harder to sin, especially if he's somebody who attends the mosque regularly or attends the Husseiniyat, he then finds it even harder to sin. How can I sin when I do this? Or imagine somebody, for example, that's, that's the Mu'addin, or Qara' al-Qur'an, or prays or leads the prayer in Jama'a, it makes it even harder and harder for him to turn towards something sinful. So you create this environment by adopting the group of friends. The Holy Prophet ﷺ says, كُلِّ مَنْ تُجَالِسْ أَكُلَّكَ مَنْ أَنْتْ This is a very important concept. That the Holy Prophet basically says, tell me who you hang out with, and I will tell you who you are. You notice how a lot of the time we say, oh, I've got this friend and he's crazy. As in, I'm not crazy, but he's crazy. Or I've got this friend and he goes to parties. Or I've got this friend and he does this. Whatever it is I say about my friend, I have a friend that lies a lot. I have a friend that says a lot of ghiba. If you have taken him as a friend and someone you regularly hang out with, then more than likely you are somebody that is guilty of these same crimes. And then people get offended. If you say, oh, I always see you with this guy, he's your friend, not my friend. I always see your comp you with this companion, oh, he's not my companion. He's just the guy that we hang out with. Well, the Holy Prophet, this is what he says. He says, tell me who you hang out with and I'll tell you who you are. These are your character this is what your characteristics are. The Holy Prophet وسلم, tells us to find friends and hang out with friends who are better than us. When I say better, you obviously I don't mean in a financial matter or in a matter of physical attraction. Better than us in faith and disposition and khuluq and akhlaq. That their mannerisms and their disposition are better. Something that will make me look good. That if I say, for example, I'm the friend of so-and-so, people say, oh, so-and-so is a very nice person. So-and-so is a very good man. So-and-so is a very pious man. The Imams tell us, Zahimul ulama. That what? Bother the ulama. That when you see the people with knowledge, bother them. Continually ask them questions. Don't let them go. Don't say, oh, I better let him be. No. On the contrary. We hear that story of a lady who comes to Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam and she says to, to the holy lady, Salawatullahi alayha, she asks her a question. So say the Zahra answers her question. So she comes back again and asks a question and asks a question. And then finally, when she comes with her last question, and these are all Islamic questions, she says to her that I'm very sorry that I've uh, troubled you with asking this question. And Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam says, Why are you saying that you're sorry that you're troubling me with this question? If you were, for example, to offer somebody, this is the example that Sayyidina Zahra uses, somebody to carry an item from a place to another place, and you offer them a reward 
such as a mountain full of pearls. A mountain of pearls is a reward to carry an item from one place to another. Would they be upset? Of course not. If somebody tells you that I'll, I'll just have to carry this thing from one place to another and I'll give you a mountain of pearls, are you going to say, oh no, or, or you don't want to do it? Or you won't do it, or would you be upset about it? This is the same thing. Fatima Zahra says, for every time you ask me a question and I'll give you the answer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for me a great reward, a huge reward. So of course I'm not going to be upset by this. This is not something that's going to upset me. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us to bother the people of Alam, bother the scholars, the people that have knowledge, so you can gain knowledge of them. So it's very important about the way we select our friends, why this creates the environment that we live in. This creates the people who we are. When somebody comes up to you and says, look, you're hanging around with bad people. He says, oh no, they're not bad people, they're good-hearted people. They mean well. They mean well. Because a lot of the time, what attracts us to our friends? Obviously, it is their personality, but sometimes you hang out with someone because they have a nice car. Or they have a car to get you around with, otherwise you can't get around. So you hang around with a certain person because he's, he, he, ta he takes you around. Or for example, they have one thing, they're generous. So you hang around with a person because they're generous. Or they tell cool stories, long stories. Lies sometimes. And so we take these people as friends all for the wrong purposes. All for the wrong purposes. Sometimes we take someone as a friend because we see that friend as protection. We say, oh, this guy is good to have a friend. Why? Because he's big and he's Muslim. And if I get into a fight, I'll always have him on my side. Or this guy is good to take as a friend because he's a gangster. He's related to some gang, some bikey gang or something like that. And if I have him as a friend, He's someone that, for example, can protect me. You notice that the people that do this, and they have a narration, they're the first people to be affected by their evil. The ones who take a friend because of this, and you have a look at it all of the time. Do you think that uh, the sciences of, of detection and policing are very advanced? The reality is, you go and ask any detective or policeman, and they will tell you most of the cases get uncovered because some of the friends of the criminal roll over on him. This is how they get it all the time. Friends of the criminal turn around and they say, oh, okay, I was there. If you let me off, I'll tell you the whole story. And they tell them the whole thing. And this is how most of them get caught. So it doesn't give them any protection. They shouldn't be committing crimes in the first place. But the point of the matter is, if you think, or you have the idea that it's going to give you pr protection, if you hang around with people that are tough or people that are bad, then you're sadly mistaken. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His prophets, through Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam, he gives us a very nice example of how we should be with the people around us, whether friends or not, just in general. He says, وَمَا عَلَيْكَ أَن تَجْعَلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْكَ بِمَنْزِلَةِ أَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ He says, and what is wrong with you that you do not take the Muslims that are around you like the people of your house? فَتَجْعَلْ كَبِيرَهُمْ بِمَنْزِلَةِ وَالِكَ that you see that the oldest of them, you take him with the status as if he is your father. So when you see the old people, you respect them as if they're your father. So when we know, for example, there's older people going to come into the majlis, for example, we'll move away from sitting on, on, the, on the sides, so that way when they come in, they don't feel guilty that, oh my God, I have to see a young person get up so I can sit down. You give them that respect. If they give you a word of advice, what does this old guy want? Well, the good old story where uh, I remember once... Uh, uh, when we were young, we were talking in a majlis, very young, talking eight, nine years old. And we were talking in a majlis and this old man stood up in front of me and my brother and he said, if you two kids don't stop talking, I'll take off my belt. So one of my brothers, I won't mention his name, says, yeah, then your pants will fall off. And we both started laughing. However, this is something that's very wrong. That what needs to be done in these situations, obviously, is you should respect him as the status of your father. That he says to you, stop talking, you stop talking out of respect that he's an elderly man. That one day you will be an elderly man too. And when you're an elderly man, you will be treated in the same way that you used to treat the, the, uh, the old people before you. He says, That the youngest of them, treat him as if he is your son. That if you see a young one messing up, don't be too harsh on him like you would be with your sons. Don't, uh, don't treat them too badly. In fact, the Holy Prophet says there's two things that I will never leave. He says, one is sitting on the floor. As long as I'm alive, I will always sit on the floor. Two, he says, 
That when I see young boys, I will shake their hands. I will do salam to them when I see young boys. This has a great effect on the young people. Because the young people are always trying to look up to the older people and, and make them impressed. This is why they do all sorts of funny things like play rugby league in the middle of, of, the, of the hall, for example. Or, uh, you know, do somersaults or whatever. They're trying to impress the people that are older than them. When you set, give your salams to them and shake their hand, this makes them feel good. This makes them feel part of the community. This makes them feel part of you. You shouldn't make them feel as if, oh, they're, just, they're, they're useless because they're young. This is something that's very important and something the Holy Prophet used to do. You, remember, you notice when, for example, somebody of significance or importance enters, he only sits and speaks with the significant and important people. And everybody else is insignificant and non-important. This is how the young boys feel when you don't do this. So you treat their, their, their kid, children as if they're your children. وَتَجْعَلْ وَتَجْعَلْ تِرْبَكَ مِنْهُمْ بِمَنْزِلَةِ أَخِيكَ that you see that the, obviously the ones that are the same age as you, around the same age as if they're your brothers. That which of these people would you like to oppress? Or which of them would you like to make dua upon? Or which of them would you like to uncover and speak about their bad things? Would you walk around saying, oh, my father does this, and my father does that, or my brother is this, and my brother is that, and say the bad things about them? No. This is the same way you should treat the believers that are around you. Nabi Isa alayhi salam tells his companions that if you see one of the companions or one of the friends that are, that are around you, or people that are in your community, and, for example, their underwear is shown, or Nabi Isa alayhi salam says worse than this, he says that their private, their private parts are shown. What would you do? And so, Nabi Isa tells them what you should do is to cover it up for them. However, what you do instead is, no, look at that guy, his private parts are shown. So you make sure everybody finds out that this is happening. Rather than you go and cover it up yourself. Rather than you go and cover it up yourself and, and, and without letting anybody know. In other words, when you see somebody committing a sin or falling into error, you don't just walk around and say, oh, you've got to hear the latest news. What's the latest news? This guy, whatever. Whatever he was doing, something evil. And I saw him doing something evil. Or I saw this guy walk into this place or walk out of that place. Or I was in this place, but it's alright that I'm in this place because I'm not religious. But the other guy <laughs> walked into that same place that I was in. You know, so they, they push that aside, the fact that they were there in the first place. But it's that the religious guy, that's the problem. And so they go around and they propagate these stories about people. Obviously, this is not, what, this is not how we have been taught to mix and mingle. This is not how we have been taught by our prophets and by our Ahlul Bayt, by the Ahlul Bayt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take friends and to be with friends. So, there's a story where the companions of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, they ask him, Man nujalis, who should we sit with? He says, Man yudhakkirakum, Man yudhakkirakum billah wa bira'yate, wa yuzidu fi amalikum mantaqih, that the people that you should sit with are the ones who when you see them, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ones who what they speak, they, whenever they speak, they make you want to do more good deeds. And they make you want to chase after the hereafter, not this world. These are the sorts of people that you need to sit with. And this is what will help you change why you create an environment for yourself. Where sitting is bad. Because when you sit with the bad people, you, you notice that people that don't care about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't care about what they do, you feel that all of the actions that you do are good. It's almost like you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to favor you because you prayed. Or you want Allah to favor you because you fasted. Or you feel that, oh, well, at least my hijab is not perfect, but I wear hijab, the other lady doesn't wear hijab. That doesn't make you better. On the day of judgment, you'll be measured up against who? Against the Imam of your time. This is who you'll be measured up against. They do also, you, you will walk up and say, I'm a follower of Imam al hujjah Ajla al Sharif. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Well, here is Imam al hujjah and here is you. What of you resembles the Holy Imam? Does the Holy Imam have a ring in his eyebrow? I'm just making sure no one's got a ring in his eyebrow around here. Does the Holy Imam have a rude haircut? 
Does the holy Imam dress, for example, in the, in the manner that we dress, etc., etc.? Does the holy Imam lie? Does the holy Imam steal? Does the holy Imam talk against his brothers? On the contrary, our Imam does du'a for us all the time. And if it wasn't for this, we, we wouldn't have anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't keep us on this earth. We know that the, the hadith says if it was not for Allah ala al-ard, al ard bi ahliha. That if it was not for the fact that the Imam is on the ground, then the earth would not accept anybody to sin on its back. It would take them in. It's only because the Imam is here that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stays around us. This is what you will be measured by on the day of judgment. Luqman gives a very nice example to his child. He says that be with the people. That when you are away, they miss you with their hearts. And when you are near, sorry, uh, and when, you, uh, when you're away, they miss you with their hearts. And if you leave, they cry over you. How many a time, for example, oh, here comes this guy. Let's walk away. Or he comes, I'm going, I'm going to go outside. Oh, this guy again is going to ask me someone. So, this guy is us. It's all of us. Because you know what? You know how you know people are speaking about you? I don't want to make anyone paranoid. It's when you don't hear anything. When an incident happens and you don't hear anything, that means the guys behind you are eating your back. They're speaking as much as they can, but none of, the, none of it comes back to you. And you think, oh, well, I must have got away with that. No one found out. You know, no one saw the, the video on YouTube. Alhamdulillah. No one saw the photos on Facebook. Alhamdulillah. So you think that you completely got away with it. But this means when you don't hear anyone talk, you, you don't hear any talk coming back to you, that means that talk is happening around you. You could be that one that rocks up and people say, oh, you know, as we said, this guy again. We have to stop ourselves from being that to others. And we have to act in a way where people come, oh, this, they're so happy. That you open their hearts when they're, when, when, when they're around you. That their presence gives them that ruhani. It gives them that, uh, that uh, advancement in spirituality. That they want to be nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are important factors that we need to work on and we need to understand. And we are taught these important factors in the plains of Karbala when we hear about the friends of Abu Abdullah al Hussein salawat Allah and the companions of Imam al Hussein. You know, there were some people on the plains of Karbala that came and fought, but they said, we don't want to die. We'll just fight a little bit and then we'll leave. These are like the people that, that for example, they say, look, man, we're going to go cruise in Brighton. And you'll be like, yeah, but I have to go to the Jafari or, or I have to go to the mosque or I have to go to wherever or my father won't let me go out. They say, alright, we'll come with you. So they come and they sort of hang out, hang out, hang out. Alright, can we go now? Can we go now? Can we go? Alright, let's go. That they don't want to go the full mile. That they'll come for a little bit, but they'll let you do a little bit so they can drag you away. This again, this is problematic. And don't think that you're going to sit there and save all the people. For you to save the people, you have to be well. That you have to be 100% well within. That even as I stand here and speak to you, obviously I don't think of myself as someone that's 100% well in my soul. However, I count myself as somebody that's just passing on the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt Salawatullahi However, for me to think that, oh yeah, this guy's bad, but I'm going to fix him up. This girl is bad, but I'm going to fix her up. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Even Imam Ali alayhi salam says that I know your illness. And I know your cure. إني عالم أو بدائكم ودوائكم. He says, however, I will not cure you بخراب نفسي. That I will not help you or cure you by destroying myself. Because Imam Ali alayhi salam during his time they said to him, listen, brother, this is how the story is. Muawiyah has got all of the power and you've got all of these governors. You're going to have to keep some of these governors in there and you know, you deal with them, be smart politically, smart according to them, smart according to them is being a thief and being a liar. Be smart and you keep them in power and eventually you'll get power. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, if I keep them in power, I'm strengthening them. But Amir al-Mu'mineen's demand is more than that. He says, no, not only will they be taken out of their posts if I become Khalif, all the money they took from the treasury, they have to return it. Even if they have to sell everything, they have to return it. Immediately everyone said, we don't want this guy. What's this guy going to be the Imam for? That he wants all of our wealth back that we've taken, that we've stolen. All of this hard, stolen wealth that we have to give back. It's hard. They don't want to leave that. So we see the companions of Imam al-Hussein on his way 
to Karbala. People start joining him. As they see him go, why do they join him? Because they think this is the grandson of Rasulullah. He's probably got the best chance of becoming the Khalif. If he becomes the Khalif, we'll say, oh, we were the nearest ones with you, so we'll get power positions. This is it. It's similar to, for example, if you look at the modern Iraq. Although I don't really like to dwell on politics, but you notice in the modern Iraq that after the overthrow of Saddam, they started putting their friends and family into power. And this is not my own ideas and thoughts. You go and ask the Iraqis themselves and they'll tell you. They'll tell you that this person was, for example, a, a, you know, owned a shop and now he's a governor. There's even pictures of the Prime Minister of, of Iraq and he used to be a, a person that sells rings and now he's a Prime Minister. That although they say, oh, he had this qualification or that qualification, the reality is that it's whoever's friends went into power. So they said, oh, you take the governorship of this, you take this post, you take that post. And this is what happened. They gave out the post like this. So as Imam Hussain was going, a lot of people joined him because they thought this guy's going to get power. So then a person came, a rider came from the Kufa with news. So he says, tell me the news. He says, the news is that Muslim ibn Atil and Hani ibn Arwa have both been martyred and their bodies have been dragged through the streets of Kufa. Excuse me, before he asks Imam al Hussein to tell him the news, he says, should I tell it to you personally? Because generally when there's bad news, they'll just say just to the leader alone so he doesn't kill the morale of the troops. So Imam al Hussein says, there's nothing hidden between us. That these are my companions, whatever is said to me can be said to them. And so, when they read the letter and they announce this, Imam al-Hussein says, this is what's happened and the people of Kufa have turned. He loses 80% of his army goes. They turn around and they say, we're not in it for this. We didn't come to die here today. We came here because we thought you're going to battle and you're going to take the position and, and whatever. When realistically, Imam al-Hussein he knew the whole time that he's heading there for martyrdom. He's heading there to reaffirm the Islamic faith and uh, to re-erect the Laws of Rasulullah, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so all of these companions, they leave him. And he's left only with his near ones. And he's left only with his family. So as he's traveling, right next to him is Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, who's also traveling. However, he's not traveling with the Imam. And in fact, what he does is because he doesn't want to meet with the Imam. Because he's afraid of meeting with the Imam. He's afraid that the Imam gives him the command and he has to obey. Now they say that Zuhair ibn al-Qayn was of the followers of Uthman. Now you have to understand that, that at that time, it was a very difficult time. There was a big fitna among the Muslims. There was, there was a, 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 so much deceit among the Muslims that a lot of them found it difficult. That where should we side? Where should we stand? Where's the truth? When clearly Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ali al haq that the haq, that Ali is with the haq. And the haq is with Ali. So this is a, a reaffirmation. And he says, and the haq, the truth, follows Imam Ali wherever it goes. Wherever he goes, the haq follows him. That the haq isn't the criteria for Imam Ali. Imam Ali is the criteria. This is huge. That he says, if you find all of the people in a, in, the, in a valley and Imam Ali in another valley, then you follow Imam Ali However, to them, for example, in the Battle of Jama, after the death of the third Khalif, they saw that in one side we've got the wife of the Prophet, Aisha, Talha, Zubair, these great companions. And the other side we have Imam Ali And even somebody comes to ask Imam Ali that, that uh, who's with the truth? Who should I stand with? Imam Ali doesn't say me, nor does he say Rasulullah said this, he says no, he says find out who, what, the, what the truth is and you will see who are the people of the truth. Find out who the truth is and you will see who the people of the truth are. That he allows him to, to form his own conclusion and form his own study about it. Because obviously if you go to the other party they're going to say of course we're with the right. We've got the wife of the Prophet on a camel over here. So, of course we're in the right, there's no... Uh, you know, there's, there's, no questions, there's no question about it. Thus, it was called the Battle of Jama. So, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn is, with the, is in an encampment next to the Imam, but he watches the Imam. If the Imam moves forward, he'll stay back for a night. And then if he catches up to the Imam, he'll slow down and allow the Imam, or he'll go ahead of the Imam. 
So he kept trying to, to avoid the Imam in any way that he could. And so eventually their two tents end up right side by side. That the camp, campment of the Imam is right next to the campment, encampment of Zuhair ibn al Qayn. And so the Imam sends a messenger to Zuhair ibn al Qayn, and Zuhair ibn al Qayn is having lunch with his family and his companions. And he says, as soon as the messenger of Imam al Hussein enters the tent, he says, whatever morsel we had in our hands dropped from our mouth. We realize that. Imam al Hussein is going to ask for our audience. This is difficult. So he says to him, the, the, the son of the grandson of Rasulullah has asked to see. So he says, We sat there as if there was birds sitting standing on our heads. So we understood that now it's clear cut for us. It's either this or that. So he stands and he thinks about it. As he's thinking about it, his wife says to him, his wife says to him that you have been invited to the audience of the grandson of Rasulullah and you're refusing? You're refusing the audience of the grandson of Rasulullah? And then he gets up and he leaves the tent and he goes to Imam Hussain alayhi salam. They say that he enters the tent with Imam Hussain and then he comes out and his face is bright. His face is bright and glowing. He walks into the tent and he says to his wife, you are free from my marriage, you are now divorced. Go back to your family. He says, I am going with Abu Abdullah al Hussein, and whoever wants to come with me can join me. And so one of the companions comes up and says, what, what happened? But this whole time we're avoiding Abu Abdullah and now all of a sudden you've had one meeting with Abu Abdullah and everything's changed. He says, Abu Abdullah al Hussein reminded me of something that's very important. He says that one day when I was in a battle with Salman al-Farsi, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we, we, we were during the battle, and we won, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us victory, and when we won this battle, we got all of the war booty. You know, when you win a battle, you take, for example, the armor and the weapons and, and the rest of it, whatever it is that you get, and they get wealthy from this. Some of the, the soldiers after the battle, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn got wealthy. So Salman looks at him and says, are you happy with what has happened? That you, you're victorious? He says, of course we're happy. He says, are you happy with the booty that you've got? He says, of course I'm happy. He says, then wait, for there will be a time when the grandson of the Holy Prophet will be in battle. And if you are of his helpers, the victory and the booty will be far greater than this. So Imam al-Hussain reminds him of this, his face glows up. He understands. All of a sudden, everything becomes clear to him, so clear that he goes back and he frees his wife. He divorces his wife. He frees his slaves, he says, whoever wants to come with me can come. I now want nothing, all I want is to be with Abu Abdullah al These, This companion, this person, who was at one stage, was people would say he's Uthman, a follower of, of Uthman, that he was on the other side, and he turns so quickly, and he joins Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Thus were the companions of Abu Abdullah. And as he goes on his journey, he gets more and more of these companions. More meetings with these companions. And along the way, to quell the uprising in the Kufa, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, uh, uh, Yazid ibn Muawiyah begins to kill as many of the companions as he can. As many of the people that might hold word of truth. And they begin to kill them and they begin to slaughter them. Of these companions, of the of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he, he's coming to help Imam Hussein. He gets caught halfway, so they arrest him. He's uh, arrested by Hasin ibn Namir or Hussein ibn Numair, and this person arrests him and sends him back to the court. They send him to the court of Abaydullah ibn Ziyad. This companion is known by, uh, by uh, the name of Abdullah. So Abaydullah says to the companion of Imam Hussein. Who is your master? He says, my master is Ali, and now his son, al Hussein. And so he says to him, you will curse these two, or you will be killed. So Abdullah says, I will curse, but I won't say any names. So he says, okay. He gives him the chance to go on the pulpit. So he stands up on the pulpit, and he says to Allah, may Allah curse you, and curse your master Yazid, and curse his father, and all the rest of them. So he agrees to cursing, but he says, I'm not going to say their names. Allah takes him down and kills him. They crucify him on a palm tree and they kill him. 
This is one of the many companions that gets killed in this manner that had the intention to go and help Imam al Hussein, but they never made it to the help of Imam al Hussein. So we see these great friends and companions of Imam al Hussein that in fact the Imam testifies himself that there is no companions like my companions. So by that time, he's left with no, hardly any companions. The 73, that's all he's left. Everyone else leaves. We get to the night of Ashura, and on this night, this is where Imam al Hussein actually seeks from the enemy. He tells them, Give us respite for one night so we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they, take, they, they say to him, Abu Fadl Abbas, he goes down and he seeks it from the enemy. And so the enemy say, Okay, we'll give you respite of one night and tomorrow will be the day of the battle. So during that night, Imam al Hussein gets his companions together. And they begin to pray. They say that the tents of Imam al Hussein during this night, during this night, were like a busy, a buzzing beehive. That they were in worship, in prayers, in recitation of the Holy Quran. And then Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he says to them that it has come to this. And you are my companions. However, tonight you are free from my allegiance. You're free. The bay'ah is no longer incumbent upon you. That obviously in Islam we have this thing that you have to give allegiance to the Imam. Whoever dies, man yamut wa lam ya'raf Imam zamanihi ma tamitatan jahiliya. That whoever dies and does not know the Imam of his time or hasn't given bay'ah to the Imam of his time dies the death of ignorance. This is why we continually give our bay'ah. Imam Sahib Zaman Ajla Fajr al Sharif, he is our Imam and the Imam of our time, and we give our bay'ah to this Imam in Dua Al Ahad and many of the other du'as that we give. That we continually, some people do it every morning with Dua Al Ahad, giving their bay'ah to the Holy Imam. Now, he tells them, You are free from my bay'ah. Furthermore, he says, Turn off all the lanterns and the candles and allow whoever wants to leave to leave. Allow them to go, allow them to leave. That now you're under the cover of darkness, so, so you can't be ashamed. You can't be ashamed to leave. That there's cover of darkness, you can leave in the way that you want to leave, and the companions begin to cry. The companions begin to scream from crying. That how can we leave you, O Abu Abdullah? What is life without you, O Abu Abdullah? You call it life? There is no life without you, Abu Abdullah. You are everything. That there's nothing you can tell us or nothing you can do to us that will move us away from you. This is what we have been waiting for our whole life is to die for you, Abu Abdullah. They would never leave him. What did they say better than this? The first of them obviously was Abu Fadl Abbas. When he tells his brother, of course, that I'm your brother and I will never leave you. Followed by these great companions like Zuhair ibn al-Qayyim, like Burair. That they stand up and they say, the first one says, he says, Wallah, by Allah, that if I was to be taken and killed, he says, if I was to be taken and killed and cut up and burnt and my ashes scattered in the wind, and this was to happen to me 1,000 times, I will not leave you, Abu Abdullah. Another companion says, he says that even if I knew that this world was eternal, that there is no hereafter. This is no longer, it's not about paradise. It's not about paradise. Imam Ali salam has that beautiful saying where he says that I have not worshipped you for your paradise, nor have I worshipped you because I fear the fire of hell. I have worshipped you because I have found you to be worthy of worship. And this is why I've taken him as a Lord. That Imam Ali alayhi salam worships Allah because he is worthy of worship. Neither the worship of the trade, the, uh, neither the worship of a merchant, where he gives away he, uh, the, uh, the worship of a mer merchant who buys paradise by obeying Allah, nor the worship of a slave that worships Allah in fear of hell. Know that he worships, worships him because he is worthy of worship. This is the same thing with these companions. That they want to die for Abu Abdullah because Abu Abdullah is worthy to die for. And so he says that even if I thought that this world was eternal and there is no hereafter, there's no reward after this, that I would still die for you, Abu Abdullah. 
And this is why Imam al Hussein is moved and he says that there is no companions like my companions. That these people that are among me and are with me and are there to help me, there is none like them. And we see on the day of Ashura the way that they fight so gallant so so gallantly and valiantly in battle that the enemy at first they begin and, and in, in the normal form of battle in the uh, among the Arabs is for one person to fight one person. This is what they do. You send out your best warrior, they send out their best warrior, you fight, and then the winner stays on. And then they send out their second best warrior, so on and so forth. Whereas on the day of Ashura, although they were outnumbered, 30,000 against 73, when people like Burair came out, and they would send one and he would get killed and send another and he would get killed. And then Umar ibn Sa'ad says, listen, these people aren't the standard fighters. Don't send out one person. From now on, go out in groups. Why? They lost too many of their greatest warriors. Umar ibn Sa'ad's army lost too much of its great warriors. So they started sending them out in big numbers and they started getting killed. Muslim ibn Awsajah, who was a great companion of Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam, when he was martyred, he had fallen on the floor and he was dying. So one of the companions comes up and he says to him, I wish that I hadn't been killed right now so I could continue to fight. However, I know you're going to get killed to the other companion. However, this is my will. My will is Aba Abdullah al -Hussain. You stay with Aba Abdullah al -Hussain. Don't even think of running away. This is my will to you. That in other words, if I had any more life within me, this is what I would go back and do. This is the will of these people who are the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Wa sayyamu al ladina zalamu ayya mun qalibin yan qalibu wa al aqibatu lil muttaqin wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alayka ya aba abdullah wa ala al arwah alati halat wa finaik. Alaykum minni salamu allahi abadan ma baqit wa baqi al layla wa nahar. Wa la ja'alahu allahu akhir la ahdi minni li ziyaratikum. Assalamu ala al Hussein. وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وأخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة وأدى ثوابها إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات تصفق الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد الله